We're going to talk now about the life and achievements of Mary Raftery, the journalist and programme maker who passed away earlier today following an illness. Mary's greatest achievement was to bring openness to Irish society. Her work revealed the suffering of generations of victims of institutional abuse. It resulted in the commissions of inquiry that officially acknowledged the extent of that abuse. Joining me, uh, three people who knew and worked with Mary on the line, musician and abuse survivor Don Baker, uh, also novelist Colin Thobin on the line, and Patsy McGarry, religious affairs correspondent of the Irish Times, is with me in the studio. Colin, we might go back uh, in time with you because you got to know her when she was only starting out as a journalist. Yes, she came into in Dublin magazine in 1979 to write about the local elections of that year, and... Um, I mean, she was very unusual. She came out of student politics in UCD, and she was, I mean, very committed to that. She'd been an engineering student there, which was very unusual for a woman at that time. And she'd also been um, a cellist on one of the Arts Council's annual reports. There's a photograph of Mary with her string quartet as young musicians. So she came in with, uh, with a lot of talents, but I suppose the most extraordinary one was how tenacious she was. And how difficult it was um, if you ever wanted to have an argument with her that you'd better be sure that you had, A, a lot of time, and B, you were always ready to give in because she would never give in herself. Mm. I mean, she was brilliant. Some of the work that she did at that time actually led her towards um, the, the victims of abuse. Yes. Um, when, 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 when I moved to McGill, she wrote for McGill, and there was one point in McGill where she wrote... Um, a, a really very long and detailed article about one of the major Dublin criminal families. And she put a huge amount of work, not just into the crimes they committed, but into who they were and where they came from. And I remember o over those weeks, her coming back all the time to say, there's something extraordinary here, each one of them, because she was, of course, going to find the family. She was interviewing the actual criminals themselves. Each one of them has been to an industrial school, and each one of them is telling me the same story. And the, the, these stories, like, uh, you know, she, she, she was amazed by them, by the level of the brutality and by people's extraordinary vivid memories of what had been done to them. So it was something that, that, that I think, was 1983. And, uh, you know, it was something that stayed in her mind as something that was there in Irish society that had not had life thrown on it. So it was something that she certainly was thinking about for a long time. Well, she went into television, and, of course, she's remembered particularly for States of Fear and the Primetime Investigates Cardinal Secrets uh, uh, programmes and a, a book in between called Suffer Little Children. But uh, you mentioned her other talents. When she joined RT first, she was involved in all sorts of different programming, including, including arts programming. She had an abiding interest in, in health matters. So she was... Um, maybe much more than the woman we remember from the immediate past. Yes, it made her a brilliant friend in that way, in that, you know, if a new singer arose, for example, a new opera singer came, Mary would be on to that, and, would, and she loved music. And um, she was also extremely funny and very good company. But when it came to work, <laughs> when it came to actually getting down to it, she was the most tenacious and serious and painstaking person. So there's a great mixture in her, um, I mean, which made her tremendously uh, sort of an intriguing person in that just how serious and dedicated she would be to work. But in other ways, she had many other interests, including, I should say, her family, to which she was also devoted to. We're going to go back to that uh, programme, States of Fear, and Mary herself came on this programme in April ninety nine to talk about States of Fear, uh, the first episode of which had been broadcast the night before. And I asked her at the time how the conditions of the children was not noticed and how the religious orders needed to deal with it. It's, it's difficult to know. What people describe is that the inspectors arrived and never spoke to the children. Um, they never addressed a word to the children. They would cast a cursory glance at the children and then they would go into the parlour of the nuns or brothers and be given a big dinner and would go home again. I mean, and so what you see in the files or you see um, a, a long list, as we saw on the programme, you know, of headings and everything was marked very good, very good, excellent, very, very, very good, very good. When we're now hearing accounts of, like, appalling conditions from many of these schools, when they did move in the 1940s in terms of the malnutrition, I mean, to be fair to them, they did move, they... they uh, so they were very concerned about what was happening. There was a new inspector who had just taken over in the 1940s and she was clearly like very enthusiastic. And what appears to have happened throughout the decades is less and less interest really in, in the system. 
I think the, the particularly the two religious orders concerned the Christian Brothers and the Sisters of Mercy, who were the major providers in this area. I don't think they've actually reached the point where they themselves have maybe confronted what happened or are, are in a position to analyse it. But I think that they, they, they need to do it at some stage to allow us to try and understand that, yeah. because you're absolutely right. I mean, in the case of the Christian Brothers, they were brought in very young. You know, and what happened in their training schools that produced people like this? That's what I'd really like to know. And there has been some confronting of uh, the, the whole issue and how it came to pass and how it could be, have been allowed to continue. Don Baker, uh, good morning to you. Good morning, Pat. You were uh, deeply shocked. You had no idea that Mary was ill. Oh, my God. Yeah, I got a call this morning at half eight. Uh, woke, woke up to that news and uh, tears flowed immediately, Pat. And, uh, she was a compassionate lady and under- great understanding for the victims of clerical abuse. Uh, she was passionate about her job and uh, also relentless in her pursuit for the truth and for justice. Uh, she was shocked and exasperated at her findings in the beginning. And right throughout, I think, and she was determined to bring truth and and and, uh, and, 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 and sought justice, you know. And um, she paved the way for others as well. Like, I mean, would Enda Kenny have come out and come down the church if it wasn't for the example of Mary? And, uh, and many others, I might add, you know, poets, musicians, um, everyone in the arts. Uh, she really, there was a great fear of the church patch, you know, but she, she met that head on. And, and my book, she's the real, she, mm. excuse me. How, how did she treat you on a, on a one-to-one oh, she level? Was, she, was, uh, she was a very humble woman. She, she's great compassion and um, she would be very sensitive. She brought me into RTE and showed me footage. She'd filmed and said, Don, is this okay? Are you okay with this? You know, and she, she didn't take it for granted. You know, she she treated you with kid gloves. She she realised abused victims were were suffered enough and were hurt enough, and she wasn't going to add fuel to the fire. She was very sensitive in that regard. You know, you uh, you actually wrote a song about abuse and, just, and played it for me. We've just recorded now. Sinead O'Connor has recorded it with Damien Dempsey. Um, Pat, this is not a time to plug albums or, or yeah. stuff like that, but just in context of what we're talking about. Uh, when I first wrote the song, I went down to Mary's house on the North Circle Road and I called into her. And we sat down and had a cup of tea, herself and her partner, and we, I played the track for her, and she thought it was fantastic. And, you know, like I was trying to say, look, Mary, I'm trying to do my bit, I, you're, you're doing your bit, I'm, trying to, I'm a songwriter, I'm trying to do my bit. And I suppose I was looking for her approval, really, Pat. And uh, with which I got, you know, and she uh, she just uh, well, had an abundance of compassion and uh, understanding and um, a bit of a saint, to say the least. And one of the main things that she brought about, uh, the main thing I'd say was healing. Um, out of all of this, out of, out of all her work, uh, has come great healing from people. Yeah. And, uh, it's and okay the sense for, for many of the victims that they were not alone. They may have felt... That's the, the, and the whole idea for the song with Sinead and Declan uh, is the same message to people who have suffered from abuse from the Catholic Church. You know, she was instrumental in getting rid of the evil within, within, within the Church, you know, which is still an ongoing process right to this very day. And she'll, rem- she'll be remembered for, for a long, long time. She's great uh, in her strength, Pat. Uh, she wasn't deterred. She hit many walls in her investigation, but she wasn't deterred. She continued on. Now, Pat, Patsy McGarry um, knew Mary well, of course. Um, you would rate her, th- of her generation, among the best. Well, without a doubt, Pat. Uh, I mean, I'm struck by some of the words that Don used there, which are very appropriate. Relentless, compassionate, sensitive to abuse victims. Uh, a bit of a saint, and, and really it's true. Uh, and uh, I mean, not many people would probably describe many journalists in that category today. But Mary was an extraordinary person, and her contribution in this area, but indeed to journalism, has been enormous. Uh, She's brought great credit to it. I mean, this station currently celebrates its 50th anniversary this year. I would say myself, uh, and I'm no great authority, but I doubt if many people would dispute the fact, that States of Fear and Cardinal Secrets were probably two of the high points for current affairs journalism Mm -hmm. uh, in RTE. Uh, they had a massive effect on Irish society and indeed further afield where the Catholic Church is concerned. I mean, let's not forget that before the third episode of the three-part series of A State Sophia was broadcast in April, May 1999, the then Taoiseach Bertie Hearn got up in the doll and apologised to everybody who'd been in a reformatory, an orphanage or in an industrial school uh, revealed by that programme for what this state had allowed happened to them. He set up the, or put in place the legislation that led to the Ryan Commission 
uh, it put in place legislation that led to the uh, confidential committee that allowed people who had been in those institutions to tell their stories privately. And he put in place the legislation that led to the setting up of the Residential Redress Board, which has paid out approximately 63,000 to over 14,000 people to date. And in fact, the closing date was last September for people who hadn't heard about it or were abroad and something like 3,000 more have come forward. That's just out of state affairs, of state affairs alone, which created a climate where people who have been abused could talk about it for the first time, even to their families for the first time, that the stigma element was reduced by that. It allowed a freedom they had never experienced before. And then in 2002, she uh, and Mick Pilo uh, broadcast uh, Cardinal Secrets, which looked at the abuse of children in the Dublin Archdiocese, uh, about clerical child sex abuse. And it led to a new form of commission uh, set up by Michael McDowell, uh, passed by the law in uh, the Commission of Be Investigation Act in 2004, which led to the mechanisms upon which the Murphy Commission yeah. was established, which looked at the abuse of children in the Dublin Archdiocese and reported in November 2009. And its remit has extended to include Cloyne Diocese, and that report was published in July of last year. Now, all of that was attributable to Mary. And even, even at the height of her illness, and she's been ill since 2010, she had periods of remission, she got down to work again and pr produced that two-part series uh, behind the walls about the, what happened in psychiatric hospitals in Ireland, which was broadcast last September by RTE. She was an extraordinary, unique person, an extraordinary, unique person and an extraordinary, unique journalist. And she just would not leave it alone. If she found something that uh, to needed to, to have light shed upon it, she would not leave it alone. To come back to, to Don's word, relentless. Mary, when she got a bit between her teeth, or got a hunch about something, uh, particularly where it involves the vulnerable, whether it be in psychiatric hospitals or in institutions or in parishes, she did not let go until she brought the truth out. Um, Colm Tobin is, uh, is still with us. Uh, I mean, you were there for her formative uh, years as a, a young journalist, but those traits were, were there from the very beginning. Yes, and I saw her speaking in New York where she showed the documentary mainly to other documentary makers. And she, and she confirmed what Don has just said, that she, that she made a decision when she'd done the interviews for States of Fear that she would show each person she'd interviewed how she'd edited it so they would be happy with that, so they would not in some way be victimized twice you know, the second time by a television mm. program. E even if it was something small that they wanted changed, she said she would have changed it. And all the documentary makers were puzzled by this, and you can't do that. That's not how we work. And she said, no, no, that's how I worked on this, because enough harm had been done. And I think that's a real, a, a real sort of measure of her independent-mindedness, of her compassion, of her seriousness, that she put a lot of thought into how RTE should proceed on this matter. And I think that um, it, that was a really important thing to do and made a very big difference to the sort of moral tone of the programme that, that she made. Well, our condolences uh, to her family and to her friends and may Mary Raftery rest in peace. Colm Tobin, Don Baker and Patsy McGarry, thank you very much.